Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Grace Church and Hymns of Grace. Uh, hard to believe this is already our fourth session together, uh, and we are now in October. Just, just amazing how fast the time flies. I continue to hear from you, uh, those of you enjoying watching the series and people sending me requests. Please keep those requests coming. We're happy to honor as many as we can. We will certainly continue this up at least up until the season of Advent, and then we'll, uh, we'll see from there. But we have a few more sessions then together. So uh, today we're going to open our, our session with a hymn requested by our good friend Paul Twelves. Uh, this is hymn 432 in our hymnal 1982, hymn 432, Oh Praise Ye the Lord. This is one of the greatest hymns of praise ever, and that is my opinion, but it's also fact, I think. The text of this hymn is by Sir Henry Williams Baker and is based on two of the great psalms of praise in the Psalter, Psalm 148 and 150, uh, right there at the end of the Psalter. Uh, that, that last little section is a, is a praise-filled section of, of psalms, uh, and the text is, of this great hymn is based on that. It was first included in Hymns Ancient and Modern. We've been talking about that. That's an English uh, hymnal, very famous English hymnal. Uh, and this, this hymn was first, or the, was first included in 1875, so it does go back a way. It was omitted from a few hymnals after that. It wasn't just automatically carried over into every hymnal, uh, though it is thought that its, its popularity, which caught on and, and again and, and, and has grown, was due to the tune that was paired with uh, Sir Henry Williams Baker's text. Uh, the tune was written by Charles Hubert Hastings Perry, or as we say in uh, sort of Anglican church music circles, we say C.H.H. Perry. Uh, and this tune is called Laudate Dominum, which is Latin, of course, for uh, praise the Lord. So very appropriate. It is quintessentially uh, British, particularly with the opening notes of the tune, which sound a little bit like uh, some of the bells you might hear ring in in clock towers, both in, in English villages, towns, cities, parish churches, and of course in our own country as well, even here at Grace Church. Uh, so the, the tune begins like this. So if you think of actually the, the second, third, fourth, and fifth notes, it sounds like the beginning of the Westminster chime, which often chimes the hour. So right away it would have popular appeal because you hear that, I know that, I've heard that in my local clock tower. Uh, just, just wonderful. Uh, the tune first appeared, and Perry wrote the tune as the conclusion to his great anthem, Hear My Words, Ye People. This is a favorite, favorite piece of mine. It's a massive anthem, it takes about 13 or 14 minutes to, to sing. It's for double choir, has a major organ part. The organist must really eat his or her Wheaties before they play that anthem. Uh, and it concludes with the hymn, uh, oh, uh, oh, praise you the Lord. Again, that Perry said and wrote uh, for this particular anthem. The anthem, Hear My Words, was composed in 1894 for the Salisbury Diocesan uh, uh, Festival Association. So if you can picture Salisbury Cathedral, if any of you have been lucky enough to go, it's an amazing place, and, you know, filled with people in this big, probably massed choir, uh, singing this big double choir anthem that, that ends with this strong, amazing tune, which has then been accepted or excerpted now as, as an independent hymn. Um, the anthem itself, Hear My Words, You People, has an extended double choir amen, and uh, some hymnals have included a sort of truncated two-fold version of that amen, just uh, something like... <laughs> itself, it's, it, it goes back and forth between the two choirs and a uh, very dramatic ending. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our, our hymnal 1982 did not include the Amen. They did not include Amens on any hymns, as some of you have noticed and asked me about. Um, but they did at least include Perry's harmonization that he wrote for the last stanza of the hymn. So we've talked a little bit about alternate uh, harmonizations, not something I do very often. Again, I, I'm always very concerned that we not try to mislead the congregation or throw them off so they can't sing. The idea is that we want to support them as an organist. This, this supports beautifully because it, uh, with very little exception, it doesn't change much about the harmony. Uh, and so this harmonization is straight from the anthem and it is meant here to be sung on the fourth stanza, or played on the fourth stanza of the hymn. So, so the choir and congregation would go to unison and no harmony from the choir, but then amazing harmony uh, and a really fabulous pedal part, uh, very busy pedal part 
for the organist. So usually we pull back and slow down just a little bit on this last verse so that all the eighth notes in the pedal don't sound frenetic. Um, I have a descant which I've written to go with Perry's harmonization. Um, and uh, I won't play that for you today, but I'll tell you a quick funny story about that descant. Uh, a number of years ago when I was at St. Paul's in Fairfield, uh, Connecticut, it's my first, uh, second Episcopal job, but first one where I had sort of a serious boys and girls choir program. And we were invited to come to St. Bartholomew's in New York City uh, in the summer of 19, in May of 1999, and do a joint even song with their relatively new chorister program of boys and girls. I was nervous, very nervous about it, very intimidated about going to New York with the choir, but the kids had worked hard and they were ready. And, and uh, when I was going back and forth with their choir master, Dan Moriarty, uh, who's a very uh, brilliantly talented guy, uh, about the service, uh, he suggested hymn 432 as the as the hymn we might close with. And uh, so I, I wrote a descant for it after we talked about it, and I, I dedicated it to the to St. Bartholomew's Choir and sent it to Dan and asked if we might do it at the festival. Well, you know, Dan's a gentleman, and so I had written a descant dedicated to his choir, so he had to say yes. So we did do it there for the first time. That was uh, around, it was Mother's Day weekend of 1999. That later that summer, uh, Dan actually uh, took another job and left St. Bartholomew's and I got a call from them and uh, went in and met with Bill Trafka, uh, wonderful Bill Trafka was the music director and interviewed for the position. And by that fall, I was actually there at St. Bartholomew's, which was uh, in my mind, pretty amazing. Uh, it was great, great time, great time there. So I always think of that descant and that summer when I think of this hymn. So what I think we'll do today, I'll play a little introduction. I'll play one verse of the hymn and then play the last stanza so that you can hear this great reharmonization. Again, listen in the last stanza for the pedal. I'll try to get most of the notes. <laughs> See, sort of like that Paul Mann's Cum Randa that we did, uh, quite quite busy. Uh, but just a great hymn of praise. Oh, praise ye the Lord, praise him in the height. Rejoice in his word, ye angels of light. Ye heavens adore him by whom ye were made, and worship before him in brightness arrayed. <laughs> singing there but you get caught up in it and that's what happens there at the end leading into that last oh praise you the lord <laughs> organ rests while the choir finishes the last word of salvation and you have for grace of salvation <laughs> there i did it again sorry i sang again you can't not do it just fantastically fabulous. So thank you, Paul, for that wonderful suggestion. So we are going to veer off to something very different. Uh, have a request from a couple of people. Um, 
Lois Lewis. We've heard from Lois uh, before, another hymn request that she made. Uh, and also we had the same request for this hymn from Pam Baker, a uh, uh, beloved parishioner here at Grace as well. So happy to do this for them. This is a hymn that comes from uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing too, which we've talked about, uh, one of our supplemental hymnals that has a little bit more of a gospel bent to it. Um, and so the hymn that they have requested is In the Garden, it's number 69 in, uh, in uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing too. Um, I've, I've had a long association with this hymn personally, growing up in the rural south. Uh, I knew this uh, well from church, uh, also from funerals. It was very popular at funerals. And uh, I, I liked it as a young person. Um, it, like anything we grow up with, we, we, we sort of like it. And then later in life, we sometimes have to reevaluate and look at it again. And I, I have great personal affection for it. Uh, often when I'm in my garden uh, uh, at, uh, on the, at the Cape and I go out in the morning in the summer and to water, and there actually is dew on the roses. You, this comes to mind, of course, because it's, it's painted a picture for us. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about this hymn. We'll, we'll hear it, uh, and then we're going to talk about it in relationship to our last hymn for today, uh, sort of a compare-contrast uh, thing. But we'll start with some information. In 1912, the publisher, Dr. Adam Geibel, asked the composer C. Austin Miles to write a hymn text that would be... And this is great. So there's a quote. Now listen closely. Just imagine if somebody said, even if you were a composer, so you, you know how to compose. But somebody says, would you write a hymn text that would be, here's the charge, sympathetic in tone, breathing tenderness in every line, one that would bring hope to the hopeless, rest for the weary, and get this, downy pillows to dying beds. I think I might have just turned and walked out of the room. That's a pretty tall order. But Mr. Miles accepted the charge, and he relates a very dramatic personal experience about writing the hymn. Uh, he was sitting in a chair holding his Bible, and, and he had really a vision of the scene of Mary Magdalene, Christ and Mary Magdalene in the garden, uh, to the point that he believed he, was, he felt that he was there in the garden with, with them. Uh, and he sort of came, awoke from what was almost a trance. Uh, this is his own story, and, and immediately wrote the poem that became the hymn. That same evening, he actually sat down and wrote the, the music to go with it. So unlike many of our hymns, this has the, the text and the tune were written by the same person, C. Austin Miles. Um, it's probably one of the most popular gospel tunes uh, ever written. Uh, and as I said, I have great sentimental fondness for the hymn. It was part of my childhood, my parents, my grandparents. I heard it at countless funerals, church services. So think just for a moment about the very personal theology of this hymn. So you may or may, you, I hope you have it in front of you. Of course, it's attached. So I hope you're either looking at it or you printed it out. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the son of God discloses. And then the refrain, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. So the hymn is really more of a private devotion than a corporate prayer. You notice there are a lot of I's and my's and me uh, language in the hymn. And the only time it's we, it's we meaning Jesus, Jesus and me, the two of us, not we, the, the, the corporate worshiping community, but just Jesus and me. That, of course, was common for hymns during that period and for that purpose, a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus. The hymn's refrain, as you just heard me say, goes so far as to say that no one else other than, the, than the, the singer or the prayer has ever known that level of joy with Christ. It says there, and the joy we share, Jesus and me, Jesus and the, the joy that the two of us share together, as we tarry there in the garden, none other has ever known. Nobody's ever known the joy that I have. So it's, it's highly, highly personal. Um, I'm gonna, so what I'll do is I'll play a little bit of the hymn uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about another hymn after that, our third hymn for today, which has a completely different theological uh, approach, but a compelling melody. Uh, I, I don't want for one second to make uh, light of the hymn or to make fun of it, but there, there's a, a running joke in church music circles. When people would sing, and he walks with me, they didn't always articulate the H of he. So for example, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. 
if you leave off the H, you get Andy. So some people have mused that Jesus' other name was Andy. Andy walks with me, Andy talks with me. So again, not at all to make fun, but it does show us the importance of enunciating every word and he. So this is a bit of I Come to the Garden. Uh, lovely, sweet, uh, sentimental hymn. I'll, I'll play us a, a, a verse or two. takes me takes me back it's amazing how quickly we, we sort of get back to our roots um, I had a I had a cousin once I'm gonna register as I talk I had a cousin named Maureen Hearn lovely lady uh, lovely southern lady who played the organ at the Presbyterian Church in in my hometown and they had a Hammond organ uh, I think it was probably a Hammond B3 that, that kind of thing but they had added one of those little keyboards that had um, that were for chimes, and they, they actually played real chimes. So the organ was electronic, but this little keyboard played a set of real chimes. I'm just looking around. I don't use the chimes much at Grace. I'm trying to find them. Uh, I'll keep talking, and hopefully I'll find them eventually. They exist somewhere, I promise. Gallery great. Gallery great. Thank you, Mr. Hines. Yes. There they are. Excellent. Okay. So uh, Maureen liked the chimes a lot, especially once they added this little keyboard for chimes. And wow, everything she played had chimes uh, on it, every single thing. Uh, and I have a fair amount of her music. And she would mark out the organ registration where we tell you the top, what, to, what stops. She'd mark through it and write chimes, no matter what it was. So, uh, however, I think that this might be effective. So let's see how it sounds. I'll do this right, perhaps. So those are the digital chimes, and they're actually the speakers that are in the back of the church, so I hope you could hear that across the way. Uh, so lovely trip down memory lane. So just for our last hymn today, we're going to, uh, as I say, do a little theological uh, compare-contrast. Uh, hymn 51, back in our, in our hymnal 1982, hymn 51, uh, tune named Decatur Place. This hymn was suggested by Jean, and Jean, I am so sorry, we, we're, I've gotten to know Jean through email and through these videos. Her last name is Radice, I hope, R-A-D-I-C-E. Jean, if I'm mispronouncing it, I'm so terribly sorry. Uh, Jean is a friend of a friend and uh, has been watching our videos. She herself is a, a fine musician and uh, a professor of music. 
uh, up in, I believe it's in New York State. Mm, so sorry, Gene, if I don't remember the town, but uh, we're so glad that you've been watching and uh, it's nice to get to know you through email. Uh, so Gene requested Hymn 51, and I'm so happy because for two reasons, well, three. One, I love the hymn. It's one of my favorites ever, so that's reason one. Reason two, it, it is the companion hymn to Hymn 34 that we did last uh, last week. Uh, a different. It's the same tune with a different rhythm and a different text, so it comes nicely off of that. And also, it's a wonderful way to compare uh, personal and corporate text. So the In the Garden being very personal, we the Lord's people, more corporate. In the 60s and 70s, uh, the Lord's people in the Lord's house on the Lord's day for the Lord's service was a saying often quoted in the Church of England and used as a teaching device to try and express uh, briefly the essence of Christian liturgy. I'll say it again. The Lord's people in the Lord's house on the Lord's day for the Lord's service. So this hymn text comes a bit out of that. Uh, we the Lord's people was Canon John Bower's first hymn and was written in 1972. A few editorial changes were proposed by the Hymnal 1982 Committee, to which Canon Bowers reluctantly agreed. And the text is so important, I'm, I'm going to actually read it to us. The, the emphasis in this hymn is on we and us, as opposed to I and me, uh, as the in the garden hymn uh, sort of espouses. This is a text for corporate communal worship. This is not a, and I'm not making a good, bad judgment. I'm just pointing out the difference in sort of corporate, uh, a hymn that's a corporate text and a hymn that's a personal text. So as personal as I come to the garden, this begins with we, the Lord's people. So right away from the first word, we're talking about I or we. So they're just, it's a very different approach. Uh, I will, uh, just before I read you the text, when I was, uh, I first became director of music at St. Peter's in Cheshire, 1991. It was my first Episcopal job. I had never been in an Episcopal church. I didn't know the hymnal. Uh, it was all sort of a revelation to me. And this was one of the first hymns when I we sang this that I sort of thought, hmm, not in Kansas anymore. Uh, it just, it was so different from, from so much of what I'd grown up with. And that I thought that the picture that the text paints of, of, our corporate and communal worship was so beautiful. So I, I, don't, I won't do this for every hymn we do, but I, I'd like to read the text. We the Lord's people, heart and voice uniting, praise him who called us out of sin and darkness into his own light that he might anoint us a royal priesthood. So not only are we, our hearts and voices united in praise of God, we're all going to be anointed into the royal priesthood. So we're all, all of a sudden, we're not only worshiping, we're also, we're also part of the priesthood of, of all believers. This is the Lord's house, home of all his people. Again, emphasis on the word all. School for the faithful, refuge for the sinner, rest for the pilgrim, haven for the weary, and all find a welcome. Now, that stanza, it's interesting, and I've, I've sung this text hundreds and hundreds of times. But just now reading it, I, I'm really struck by, if you think back to, let me go backwards in my paperwork, I'll do my best. If you think back to the charge that C. Austin Miles was given when he wrote in the garden. Remember the, the charge? It must be sympathetic in tone, breathing tenderness in every line, one that would bring hope to the hopeless, rest for the weary, and downy pillows to dying beds. And what did I just read to you here? Refuge for the sinner, rest for the pilgrim, haven for the weary, all find a welcome. So in many ways, this text and the text of In the Garden, in some ways, the goal was, was similar. That's pretty amazing. This is the Lord's day, day of God's own making, day of creation, day of resurrection, day of the spirit, sign of heaven's banquet, day for rejoicing. And the fourth verse, particularly Eucharistic, in the Lord's service, bread and wine are offered, that Christ may take them, bless them, break them, and give them to all his people, his own life imparting food everlasting. So just a, a glorious text, one of the best ones in our hymn book, I, I think. Uh, so now a word about the music, uh, which is really quite in, in, important. Uh, the tune is by Richard Wayne Dirksen, who wrote Innisfree Farm, which was hymn 34, which we did last week. This tune is called Decatur Place, and it was composed in response to the hymnal committee's request for a rhythmically more accessible version of Innisfree Park. So just a quick reminder, 
get a screw farm that we did last week. They're, they're a half step apart, so don't be alarmed by that, it doesn't matter. Industry farm is in A flat. This is the one that had the slightly arrhythmic text. Like so. so the hymnal kidney basically said, that is beautiful. But will you give us a second version that is more uh, quarter note based and not irregular and maybe a little more accessible for people who don't read music? So Mr. Dirksen very kindly did that. I don't know if it was his decision to move it up a half step or if the committee thought it might just be a nice, nice differentiation. Anyway, this tune is in A major and instead of the A rhythmic, it's rhythmic. Suddenly, the tune which on hymn 34 was accessible in that it's quite stepwise, this tune is the same melody, so it's very stepwise, but also now the rhythm is simpler and, uh, and, and a, little bit, a little bit easier to sing. Um, they each have their own, uh, I think, strength uh, and charm, uh, but this, this is, uh, again, just so we can draw more people into the singing of the hymn. The tune name for this, Decatur Place, honors the Washington composed the Washington home, sorry, the Washington home of Paul Calloway, the composer's longtime friend, and also was his predecessor at the Washington National Cathedral. You might remember uh, Richard Wayne Dirksen was at the National Cathedral, I believe, seventy-seven to eighty-eight or seventy-eight to eighty-seven, somewhere in there. Uh, Paul Calloway was his longtime predecessor, uh, and so he named it after his home in Washington, Decatur Place. Uh, so. You've heard a lot about this. I won't go on and on, but I'll play a couple of verses for you of what I think is just really one of the most beautiful hymns in the hymnal. Uh, one thing that also sets it apart, not to give too much of a music theory lesson, but but most hymns, we probably know music has key signatures. So a music, a piece of music is in the key of C, A, D flat, something. Usually the hymn ends on the chord of that key, right? So if you think about, oh gosh, well, let's think, I don't know why I'm doing this, Joy to the World, we talked about that a few weeks ago. Joy to the World is in D major, and it ends in D major. We call that ending on the tonic, or the home note of the key. The dominant is five notes up. So in D major, that would be an A. So if the Joy to the World ended on the dominant instead of the tonic, it would be something like this. you crazy. Sorry, I can't seem to play that hymn today. But you see what I mean? So that's very unusual for a hymn. Very unusual. This hymn, in the harmonization, it actually ends on the dominant. Uh, it's not quite as jarring as, as that is because we know that so well and we don't expect that. But it does end on the dominant, uh, which leaves you thinking a little bit like you haven't, it's not as, it's not as ended, it's not as finished, so like our work might be going on. Uh, so I'll uh, play you a couple of verses of this lovely, lovely hymn, Hymn 51, We the Lord's People.
So I'll leave you with one last thought today. After our three hymns, thank you to all of our folks who sent in hymns again. Please feel free to do that. Um, our Thursday at noon concerts, we have some exciting news about that. Beginning next, well, this Thursday, actually. So today is Tuesday. So let's, beginning this Thursday, two days away, uh, the Thursday noon concerts will be offered in person with uh, up to 30 people coming here to Grace Church. There are, of course, a, a list of restrictions and guidelines uh, in keeping with COVID and to make everybody safe, as safe as we can possibly make it. Uh, those guidelines uh, are on our website and you can go there to see uh, what, what's required. And really the main requirement is to register with me by emailing me at vedwards at gracepvd.org to let me know that you plan to come, sending you me your phone number and the number of people in your group. Uh, as long as we haven't reached 30 people, you'll hear back from me saying, great, we'll see you then. And if we've reached 30 people for that week, I'll let you know that. And we will record the concert still, and it will still go out Thursday afternoon and be available to you uh, at, in, at home. Uh, but for those who feel comfortable and would like to, to venture out and come on Thursday to hear a concert of music, uh, which this Thursday will be me playing, we'll be happy to see you here. Uh, let us know if you have questions about that. And thank you for joining us today for Hymns of Grace.